thank you all for coming. And uh, th this is going to be the session on uh, uh, in innovative entrepreneurship. So we're going to have three speakers. Uh, I'll start and talk about uh, uh, ecosystem, Silicon Valley, Bangalore, and so on. And, and then uh, we're going to have uh, Dr. Kurkoff, who's going to talk about innovation in Japan. And uh, then we'll have uh, Professor Ishikura, who's going to talk about uh, global innovation. So I uh, hope you all had a good l lunch. And I'm going to talk about uh, entrepreneurship, ecosystems, Silicon Valley, and Bangalore. Now, uh, a business ecosystem typically has a bunch of organisms like uh, uh, manufacturers, uh, customers, competitors, distributors, and so on. And, and uh, uh, in such a system, typically you have uh, one or two key companies that provide focus and direction and a vector to the whole ecosystem, okay? So uh, th as the examples, uh, we've got uh, uh, Microsoft is a good example, and Walmart. Okay, in Microsoft, the direction is given by uh, a common platform, which is uh, the operating system itself. And, and then there, there are many niche companies uh, around this central uh, theme, which is the operating system. And, and they uh, leverage uh, their produ productivity and innovation uh, off of this uh, common platform. Same thing with Walmart. Uh, what they have is a Retail Link, which is a software package that allows their vendors and uh, 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 manufacturers to track customer behavior, purchasing, and so on. And, and that allows all those folks who are peripheral to the, uh, to the uh, main focus of the ecosystem, it allows those folks to uh, uh, leverage their distribution and uh, uh, minimize the costs and increase efficiency and uh, profitability. So, so that, that's two examples of ecosystems which have common platform and niche players. Now, if you're looking at ecosystems that uh, are focused on entrepreneurship, an entrepreneurship ecosystem, then you, you would have uh, a bunch of uh, uh, basic elements. First of all, you need a large number of venture companies uh, because you, you need to have churn of ideas, uh, uh, dynamism, uh, momentum, and activity, just activity, okay? So, so you need a large number of venture companies. You need good access to venture capital because without venture capital, uh, you're not going to be able to uh, uh, drive those companies. I, you need some highly skilled labor pool uh, in order to uh, uh, keep those companies going. Let's see. The key word for innovation in these days are threefold. One is here, personalization and collaboration and innovation. And that was a three-part report published by the Economist Intelligence Unit earlier this year. And according to the assessment, Japan was listed as number one in innovation, but I think personalization and collaboration are more important to really develop, like uh, DB uh, presented to you to the marketplace. Also, I'd like you to note, recently we are using rather international uh, to like global. Everybody talking about global, but 10 years ago, everybody talking about international. So why is it? Third, there's many, Quite often, you, we use human capital rather than human resource. And then think locally, act globally. 10 years ago, we are talking about think globally, but act locally. And this phrase was developed by Professor Ishikura uh, recently. And then civil society, social entrepreneurship, and we also heard this morning, economics. These are the sort of secrets. Why is it? There's a two factor for innovation become so popular. One is, Revolution in information technology. Number two is out exterior constraint for economic growth. That is climate change and energy, natural resource and water foods and poverty. All these issues become quite apparent. All right, so in fact, innovation become one of the keywords only over the last 10 years or so. This is a a uh, figure adopted from uh, Richard Nelson's the Handbook of Innovation. And in fact, innovation become rapidly rose as one of the keywords in scientific articles in social sciences and business since 1994. Why is it? And there must be a reason. If you review there's some of the technological revolution, which really changed the world we live right now, I think according to Freeman and Perez, perhaps 
we are towards the end of fourth paradigm of technological revolution, which led to the economic paradigm and social paradigms to the fourth stage of information technology. Now, according to their analysis, in fact, this industrial revolution started 1769 from James Watt. That is a change in the energy into the power, like horsepower was used to be used, but that led to completely different trade and also the ability for you to communicate and send postcard to a distant friend and a lot of canals and waterways. And that was one of the paradigm which lasted around 50 years, which really reached the maturity. Then this was replaced by steam engine and railways. And then that's from 1829, they matured rapidly replaced by steel, like uh, Carnegie, and electricity and heavy engineering, which really allows us to build a big structure like this hotel because of steel, not by, the, by just simple, uh, simple iron. And then that's become really mature. Mature means it spreads out to the society, so the gain over the investment becomes less and less. Uh, I think we, we do have an opportunity for innovation in service rather than manufacturing, because a lot of companies in Japan are proud to be an innovative manufacturers, but not too much in service. However, we have a lot of challenges for Japan, and one of them is the traditional hierarchy and power structure and uh, outdated rules and uh, uh, regulations. I once worked for the Re Regulatory Reform Committee for the government, and a lot of regulations were set up like 50 years ago. And just take a look at what, what ha happened in the past five years. It's just totally different story. So this is somewhat related to that uh, CEO roundtable when the, the regulations and infrastructure is so much behind from what the reality requires. That's uh, even more so for Japan. And uh, another one is the, the absence of global perspective and global rule maker or rule taker. Do we have any Japanese companies which can be called global rule maker? Can we name any? And I don't think there are any big corporations which have set up the global rules as such. And we're, we do have the, uh, the, the issue about the global hunt for talents as well. Because most of the Japanese big corporations in particular seem to be pretty much comprised of the Japanese nationals, men, I mean women, some, and whatever age. So that's a, that's a big challenge for the diversity today. And I see a little bit of a warring tendency among the younger generation as well. Um, let me just go back a little bit. We do have a G8 summit next year in Japan. And I think that's a tremendous opportunity for Japan and for the Japanese corporations to display, to show off, to show to the world what kind of technology we do have, how we can make, make it available to resolve the global issues. It remains to be seen whether we can actually do that, publicize, or you know, does the, the enough public uh, relations uh, campaign or not. And Takanaka and others, are, including myself, are working to make sure that that message is, uh, is uh, uh, delivered. 